Other pieces of treasure, however, were not found, and years later would become the subject of life and death struggles. Trainloads of priceless treasure rolled across the German countryside. Hitler's officers made sure the plunder of Europe was complete. It included the most precious thing of all, humanity. Hundreds of thousands of Jews would be herded aboard Hitler's trains. Many would die of starvation along the way. The trains leaving collection centers throughout Europe were expressions of fundamental Nazi philosophy. To be other than German was to be inferior. To be Jewish was to be despised. At the end of the line were the concentration camps. They were foul stockyards of humanity stripped of hope. With the Jews, Hitler found the scapegoat he needed to explain Germany's failures between the wars. The Nazis were stealing lives now, and they weren't above making a profit at it. Grisly crimes were committed by the Nazis in their dozen-year reign of terror in Europe. Worst of these were the assaults on human dignity, typified by the robbing of gold from the mouths of murdered Jews. Another atrocity was the collection of huge sums in gold and diamonds from concentration camp inmates who thought they could buy back their lives. They couldn't, but they made their killers rich trying. The horror of it struck home when the Allies took over the camps. They entered as liberators, but there were no cheering crowds. They beheld instead a tragic spectacle. Treasure could be recovered, but lives could not. The task would be enormous. Perhaps it would never be completed. The great bulk of Nazi plunder would be recovered immediately after the war. Uncounted millions, however, disappeared with Hitler's henchmen. Men who, like Martin Bormann, are still at large. Among them, Dr. Joseph Mengele. He conducted unspeakable research on the inmates of concentration camps. Inmates would have sooner faced the ovens than Mengele's knife. At Nuremberg, the Allies tried top Nazi leaders captured at war's end. But the colonels and majors of the Third Reich carried their treasures with them into peacetime Europe. Austria's Lake Toplitze, gold bars and hundreds of thousands of counterfeit English pounds were recovered from the lake in 1957. What better place for hiding treasure quickly than a deep alpine lake? How much remains to be discovered? Two men have disappeared trying to answer that question. The search goes on in spite of the lake's ominous history. The Austrian government tries to discourage treasure hunters, but the lure of Nazi gold is powerful. Two volunteer firemen from a nearby city have dreamed of the riches that may lie beneath the lake. The dream brings them to Toplitze again and again. Perhaps this will be the day. The quest is exhilarating, but not without danger. Vigilance is important. Treasure hunters are optimists and it is a fine day for a dive. Optimists, yes. But the treasure hunters know other hunters may be abroad. The men who hid the gold were not strangers to killing. Who knows where they are now? The water is deep and cold. It is easy to see how it has kept its secret for more than 30 years. The divers are spurred by the knowledge that the quest paid off once. There was another time when blood may have been spilled to keep the secret of the lake. The secret was born in 1945. The Nazi hierarchy, not killed outright, was in flight. If they were caught, 
They might lie their way out of long prison sentences, but not if they were caught with treasure. Fortunes must have been hidden in haste. Lakes along the escape route beckoned. Almost 20 years later, some of the treasure has already been found. Perhaps someone was there to make sure no more would be. Did the divers find something? Something that cost them their lives? We only know that they vanished. Some think the underground Nazi movement called Odessa was involved. It is 1976. No one will vanish on this dive. There will be no treasure either. It is possible that the gold remaining in Toplice was moved years ago when its guardians felt others closing in. There are many other lakes and many secret bank accounts. Serious investigators don't dismiss the notion that there are still men in hiding who would see Hitler's nightmare world reborn. Great treasure would have to be close at hand to once again unleash the dogs of war. That prospect alone may be enough to drive men to continue the search for Nazi plunder. Florence. The capital of Renaissance culture is the center for the continuing search for the plundered art treasures of Europe. Rudolfo Siviero is the most active of the art detectives. He stayed on the trail of Nazi art thieves long after others had given up. Siviero has searched thousands of German documents for clues. With them, he has recovered dozens of stolen masterpieces. Manifests, bills of lading, army memos, reminders of past outrages. The collections of the Uffizi Gallery and the Pitti Palace in Florence have been reconstructed through the work of Seviero and his colleagues. Yet Seviero estimates that a third of Italy's plundered art is still missing. He thinks much of it is hidden behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany. One of his hardest tasks has been to root out the fake masterpieces that began showing up after the war. Museums, anxious to restore their collections, often fell victim to swindles. The flood of copies has made it even harder to trace the fate of the originals. Siviero remains dedicated to restoring his nation's art heritage, no matter how difficult the task. It is important for men like Siviero to believe that beauty can endure. It must endure if man is to banish the ugliness of war. Perhaps, if beauty endures, the flaming destruction of the past can finally be cast aside. Lost civilizations, extraterrestrials, myths and monsters, missing persons, magic and witchcraft unexplained phenomena. In search of cameras are traveling the world seeking out these great mysteries. This program was the result of the work of scientists 